Hi everyone and welcome back. Uh, I didn't realise I was on annual leave until two days ago. So it's a Monday and I'm at home with my pyjamas, no makeup and my coffee. And I thought I'd answer your questions that you asked from my previous video. So first question, um, it's by Favour A. Hi. Um, she asks, how many hours do you work on a typical day and how much do you get paid? So my normal day is nine hours, so I'll start at half eight and finish at half five. When I do my on-call shifts, they are 13 hour shifts. So they typically start about half eight and I finish at half nine. And how much do you get paid? So I've been on three rotations this year, surgery, gastro, and a geriatrics. And my pay, um, changes on all of them because your hours of on call are a bit different but on average every month after tax i get around two thousand pounds so i don't know how much that makes on a like a yearly salary um pre-tax um but that's how much it is and those who work within london get about 100 pound more per month than those who are out of london you get something called the london waiting which is where, because if you live in London, life is more expensive, they kind of help you out a little bit. Okay, she also asks, how far do you live from your hospital? So it's often a 20 minute drive if there's no traffic, but that turns into about 40 minutes in the morning. Um, does your hospital give you your own scrubs or do you have to pay for them? So um, the hospitals have scrub machines and you get a scrub point put on your um, ID card. So what you do is you go up to the machine, tap, and then it already knows your size and it'll just dispense. Um, a scrub set and you can't get another one before handing that one back in so it, say, it stops people from like taking them home or prevents them from getting lost and stuff so no we don't have to pay for them they get given to us do you live in an apartment no um, I used to live in a flat and we've moved out we were there whilst our house was getting renovated so um, I've just got my last bits left before I'm going to do a house tour so yeah we're living in a house at the moment so someone called et hi says what are the procedures an fy1 is expected to do so not many actually they're all the things that we do in medical school so we have on our e-portfolio we have some procedures that we have to do and get signed off by the end of the year some of them are really simple things like such as like bloods and cannulas others are catheterization which are things like putting in tubes into people's penises and females urethras to enter the bladder and basically uh, empty the bladder into a bag without them having to go to the toilet and there's various reasons for that um injecting local anesthetic um what else administering iv fluids administering blood transfusions so those sorts of things so they're not overly complicated um but those are the core things you have to do but you can do other things um, if you're taught by your seniors, such as um, when I was on gastro, I used to do something called um, acidic taps. This is when people have um, a buildup of fluid in their tummy region. You want to take a sample of that fluid to send to the lab. Um, so we used to go into the tummy with a needle. And so I was taught how to do that, which was quite interesting. Zed Hussein asks, what F1 rotation did you enjoy the most and why? So it's going to be really cliche, but I enjoyed all of them in a different way. So I started on surgery and surgery is a big sort of speciality in, um, in hospitals. And that means that there's lots of F1s on that rotation. So when I started on surgery, there was nine of us and we were all together during, not all, always, but some of them would be on like annual leave, some would be on on call and, but there would be at least like four to five of us at any one time. And it was really great to get to know each other. We used to sort of de-stress and have a bit of bants and like if we were annoyed about anyone we'd kind of like have a little bitch and that sort of stuff um but yes yeah, so that's why i really enjoyed surgery and then the reason i enjoyed gastro so when i was on gastro it was um we had a ward but we it was only a few patients so it meant that i was only looking after five to six patients at any one time so i really got to know them well i knew what i was doing there was patients continuity um, and basically it's, it's one of those things where if it's not gastro related, you can just be like, no, sorry, that's not gastro. We're not taking them on sort of thing. Um, instead of 
sort of general medicine where everything falls under you so you just have to do it and just get on with it but gastro wasn't like that and I really enjoyed it um, and I really that's when I really got to learn um, medicine a bit better and then so now I finished on geriatrics um, I enjoyed Jerry's. So geriatrics is medicine of elderly people. And in the hospital that I work at, there's um, a large population of older people. So majority of our wards are geriatric wards. Um, I mean, I enjoyed it just slightly less than the others, just because um, I generally don't enjoy geriatric medicine as compared to the other things that I did. But the team that I worked with was great. The consultants were great. And usually... Ooh, Usually geriatricians and um, others that work in geriatric medicine are very, very nice. They're so compassionate, very gentle. It's, it's just really nice to watch them interact with patients. So I really enjoyed that side of things. Um, but will I be doing geries? Probably not. So, um, Cara, Car, Kare? Sorry if that's wrong. Um, asks, I noticed you're wearing a wedding ring and, and, and an engagement ring. Are you allowed to wear that on the ward? So, no, you can only wear one. Um, oh, it's so hot. Oh, who else is enjoying the hot weather? Yeah, me neither. Anyways, so you're only allowed to wear a plain wedding band on the ward. Um, so what I usually do, I usually take off my engagement ring and either put it on um a necklace or just leave it at home um so yeah so the uniform not uniform but the infection control sort of things we need to obey by are really strict so you're only allowed to wear a simple wedding band um no bracelets no watches you have to be bare below the elbow so if that means rolling up your shirt or wearing short sleeve stuff that's what you have to do um hair has to be tied up I'm a bit guilty of not doing that sometimes, but obviously when I go to see patients and I'm, and I'm at patients' bedside, I do. But just generally when I'm in the office, I just don't like, I just don't like tying my hair up. I look like a peanut, um, and I don't want to look like a peanut at work. So I try not to tie up as much as I can. But obviously when I'm with patients, I do like before I take blood and that sort of stuff. Um, she said, "What rotation did you enjoy in F1?" So I've answered that. Um, so I know you mentioned studying fluids prior to F1. Have you heard of the Oxford Handbook for Foundation um, program? Is it any good? Do you recommend it? So I have that book and I kind of flicked through it a couple of times and it is quite um, informative and it's to the point and it's very relevant to the sorts of things that you see daily on on call or on your board work. To be honest, I haven't read it so I can't really say if I recommend it or not. That'll just be a lie. But I know it is one of the better books out there. But just be careful with the specific sort of dosing or um, protocols that they give you because every hospital is different. So if you have no idea of how to treat a certain thing and your hospital doesn't have a protocol specifically for it, you can refer to it and you won't be sort of penalised for that because it's, it's a known thing that you can do. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I wouldn't kind of use it too much on a day-to-day -day basis. Lucy um, asks, I was wondering how you found the F pass applying for foundation in general and how did you choose your deanery? And did you apply for AFP? So I'll start from the end. I didn't apply for AFP. So AFP is an um, academic foundation program. So you do your F1 and within your F2 year, you do like some sort of research or like an academic component to your training program. Um, and that's usually quite competitive to get into and the application is a bit different. Um, I just wasn't very interested in the academic side of things, so I just didn't apply for it. Um, but loads of my friends did and some of them got in, some of them didn't. But um, in the end, everyone sort of ended up where they wanted to anyway. Um, how did I find applying for FPASS? So FPASS has now changed and it's called Oriol. Um, and that's the website that you use to apply for your specific deanery. So the application process is very straightforward. You just do your details, like your name, address, blah, blah, blah. And then it asks you to upload a picture of your degree certificate if you've got an um, BSc from before and um, link evidence to any kind of publications that you have. So it's pretty straightforward. 
coming to rank in your deaneries, um, if you know where you want to go, then it's very easy. I knew that I wanted to be in London or close to London, mainly because my family was here and also because um, my fiance at the time, now my husband, um, was working in London. So if I was to go somewhere really far, it would mean that he'd have to change his job or he'd have to like travel really far to get to his job. So it was just convenient for us to be in London. Um, and I'm very, very lucky that I did get the deanery that I wanted. The main issue that I had was ranking all my jobs once I did get the deanery. So some deaneries are massive. They have like 800 jobs going, for example, like South um, Thames Deanery. And if you have a low score, low-ish score, which means you can be anywhere on that ranking, you can be at the bottom or the top, you need to rank a lot of stuff. And like, it took me a good week. Like, I didn't just do it like, eight hours a day for a whole week, but it took me a good week for me. I had 300 jobs to rank to just put everything in order. Um, so yeah, that was the only stressful part. Zarin A asks, I was wondering if you worked with or know anyone who did FY1 um, after medical school in Europe or outside the UK, whether there are any gaps and differences that need covering before working in the NHS. Um, so, I get this question a lot from people who watch my video um, there's lots of medical students that study internationally and they're wondering how to come to the UK to join the foundation training program as an F1 so I kind of looked into this a little bit and there's an eligibility criteria so there's a website I can actually link it down below that you go in and I think you enter your details and your qualifications and so on and it tells you if you're eligible to actually apply and I think from there on once you've actually proved um, your qualifications um, applying is quite straightforward but I'm not 100% and this isn't an area that I know of very well. Um, are there any people who have studied from Europe? So there are a couple of SHOs, so these are senior house officers, not F1s or F2s, that are working with us and they've come from various parts of the country and the things that they usually struggle with a little bit is things that are very specific to the UK. So those things are, like, once patients are discharged, where do they go? So obviously that's a very UK system specific thing, like care homes, nursing homes, going homes with like carers and those sorts of things. Um, some of the antibiotics that we use, are like for example, at my hospital, we use an antibiotic called gentamicin a lot. And what this means is that there's like levels that you need to take and then there's like dosing changes that you need to do. So those things are a bit different and people haven't really studied that. Um, apart from that, people generally settle in quite well. Um, it takes time to get to know the system within the hospital as well. Um, in some places, medicine is quite kind of doctor-led, whereas in the UK, it's a bit more of a multi-disciplinary multi team sort of setting, and you're not just working on your own, and there are different people getting involved. Um, so I would say those are the only differences and actually once they settle in um, they do quite well It just takes them a little longer than the F1s who have studied in the UK to settle in but actually in the end it's okay So, um, Muscab Soyan Sorry um, Says I am approaching final year of medical school abroad and will come back to practice in the UK And I was wondering how much of what we are taught is used in everyday practice in F1 are there subjects that I should study more to make F1 easier? Um, so there are some subjects in medical school which you probably won't use ever. So things like embryology, um, neurophysiology and that sort of stuff. But it's difficult because I can't pinpoint a subject and say, oh, this was just totally st stupid. Why did we ever learn this? Because it's the way that the subjects all come together that actually give you a better understanding of everything so the physiology and the biochemistry so when you when you're presented with a patient and say for example the patient has low blood pressure okay so instead of memorizing all the causes of low blood pressure you could think so thinking back to my physiology what causes low blood pressure i've identified this thinking to that specific part of physiology what biochemical things can affect that 
and it's all those sorts of things that come together so i can't actually pinpoint and say that this subject was just useless and this subject was great because they all come in together even the really tedious kind of points of anatomy that you think are just silly and why do i need to memorize all of this they all come together um the things that are really sort of specific and that you should know for f1 um maybe concentrate a bit more on pharmacology so this is so one thing that we used to do a lot on on calls is when a patient comes in and you have their medication list you go through that and you check to see if what they're on is appropriate are there any interactions are the medications that you're going to be prescribing going to interact with any of their regular medication and that and that sort of stuff so um going over a bit of pharmacology um but not like the in-depth like molecular level but on pharmacology just which kind of medications interact with what and for what reason and that really helps in f1 i i found um so phaser asked have you ever lived in turkey before um no i was born in the uk um and i did go back to turkey for my elective so in medical school you got you get given a four to six week opportunity of going to a foreign country or you can choose to stay in the uk which a couple of people did learn their sort of medical system um see the differences and just for example if you're interested in a very specific speciality experience that and then you write a small report on it and it's kind of like a little really nice addition to the end of your medical school so for that i went to turkey um just because i don't go i do go there often but i don't i always go on holiday and i never get to really um experience what daily life is like so like going on holiday to a country and actually living there is different so i went there and i actually lived there so i was like shopping i was like getting on the public transport and that sort of stuff so i really enjoyed it and it really helped me to get to know um, my background a bit better and also some of the other reasons why I chose to go to Turkey was because I had family there so I had accommodation sorted and it was just a bit easier to sort out which hospital I could go to um, so that was great and I really enjoyed my time there okay sorry um, I just had to go and open the garden door because I'm dying I might be Turkish but I'm just not designed for hot weather and you might hear a bit of wind and like ruffling and it's just coming from the garden I'm sorry um, so let's carry on. Daria asks, um, do you have any written examinations and foundation training? So no, um, you'd be pleased to know that once you sit your um, finals exam in medical school, you won't have to do exams for at least a year or so. Um, so there's no specific written exams that you have to do within the training programme. The only thing you need to complete is your e-portfolio. So that's where you do specific procedures or you discuss a case or you do an examination and you send off sort of um, virtual tickets to, for, to people to sign off and to say that you've done them. Um, but people do choose to sit exams. So once you um, progress, you need to do some exams such as the MRCP for that's an um, exam where you need to do if you are interested in doing general medicine and its branches. Um, MRGP if you want to do GP training. Um, so I'm due to sit that in January. Um, or other things so, such as international exams. So I have a couple of friends who are applying for the USMLE and they're doing those exams. But there are no specific examination, exam, written exams you need to do um, for the foundation programme. So she says, I've heard that junior doctors get treated terribly and get yelled at constantly by consultants, but is this just a stereotype or is it true? So this is a stereotype. I think the reason why people think that is because um, you see the, dra the medical dramas um, from the US and I think the US system is a bit different and they're treated slightly more harshly and they're, they're ex the juniors are expected to do more than in the UK. But in the UK, um, we're treated very well, um, specifically by consultants. So they're very approachable, they're very kind, um, they will answer any questions you have. Because at the end of the day, you're, you're looking after their patients. So they're open to any questions you have if it's going to make you better at doing your job. And there are, besides a couple of consultants, um, there isn't really the sort of feeling of a hierarchy. So I'm at the top, you're at the bottom sort of thing. Um, and because 
everyone sees each other as working as a team and the team will not function without one person. So although the consultants will make the important decisions and they'll sort of run the ward round, they know that the that things won't be done and the ward won't run basically without the juniors there doing the jobs for them. Um, so it's a very pleasant working environment and everyone's very supportive. So these are other seniors as well, such as registrars and SHOs. Um, so yeah, I, I don't like, I've never been shouted at by a consultant. I mean, I have had annoying consultant, like p um, consultants getting annoyed at me, but they were annoying themselves. So it was just equal. Um, but yeah, apart from that, no that's all the questions thank you very much for asking those questions on my last video and i hope i've been able to answer them um as you expected me to if you have any more questions that come up in um, pop into your mind then just pop them in the comments below and i'll just answer them for you um let me know if you have any kind of video ideas that you want me to do um i am going to do a bit more sort of Difficult things such as dealing with death and how I dealt with it um, the first time and I am going to be doing a house tour soon. Um, I'm just waiting for my dining table to be delivered and then I'll show you my house. Um, and that's it really. And I'm just going to go and shower now and wash off the half a litre of sweat I have down below because it's so hot and I don't enjoy the hot weather and people are like oh you guys ask for the hot weather and then you moan about it i never asked for it and i'm gonna moan about it um the uk just isn't designed for hot weather it just gets really humid and sticky and a bit gross um but am i enjoying the sunshine in general yes but am i enjoying um the heat no anyways um i'll see you in my next video bye